This is John Canalopoulos. Thank you so much for listening to this talk. Um, this talk uh, encompasses the work of almost 20 years, whether cross-linking alone uh, is enough in treating uh, uh, progressive keratoconus and uh, that we actually need to also perform a partial refraction uh, customized, topo-guided in this talk, normalization along with cross-linking. Uh, these are my financial disclosures, and I do consult for several companies of which products I will discuss, but none with this technique. Now, uh, we presented last year at the um, uh, ESRS in uh, Paris uh, the advanced normalization techniques uh, to treat irregular corneas and keratoconus, and this is the first slide from that presentation. And uh, also, uh, just a few months before that, we presented the 10-year outcomes of progressive keratoconus management with the Athens Protocol. This is what we named our uh, introduction of combined partial and refraction topography-guided uh, eczema ablation and higher fluency Excel. And this is the, the uh, uh, signature picture of the pre-op uh, cone on the left, the end result in the middle, and the difference on the right. And the importance of this is the accuracy of this correction. You can see that there is a over 10 diopter flattening. It's exactly where the cone should be, uh, which is a testament of how accurate the delivery of the laser is from the topographic data registered to the actual ablation. And we all know that it is not possible to get a 12 diopter flattening with cross-thinking alone. So in this patient that is almost 16 keratometry, the refractive benefits are um, obvious. Now, cross-thinking can be combined with other things as well, such as uh, intracornea ring segments, uh, collagen shrinkage has been described, uh, fake contractor lens. Uh, we've introduced also Fento Pocket as a means to conduct cross-thinking. Uh, we've introduced it as prophylaxis for LASIK, and it has been used for infectious keratitis as well. Uh, and this is our uh, landmark paper uh, over uh, 13 years ago in the Journal of Cornea. You can see this is a busy slide, but this is a before and after got the benefit, which is uh, image C, and uh, the patient still uh, required a rigid gas permeable contact lenses to function uh, with spectacle division was 2080, and the patient was incapacitated. And in our country, being in Southern Europe, having a lot of sand and particles in the atmosphere, uh, RGP lenses are almost impossible to wear. It's a rarity that somebody can tolerate them. So between doing a transplant or proceeding with the Athens protocol, we chose the second, and this is where the procedure was born. You can see the treatment plan on, on image D, the uh, uh, post-op image on uh, uh, image E, and the difference that the treatment accomplished on image F um, and the other eye on the bottom has uh, progressed. So this was the landmark paper. Now, how do we do uh, the procedure? This is also very important. We don't treat every patient that looks like they have keratoconus. We try to image the family as well. We presented at the ACRS that there's a very strong family predilection, almost 100%. Uh, we want to make sure what the residual stroma is, and we use other means besides sign fluke tomography, such as uh, OCT. Uh, we want to make sure uh, how well the patient is functioning with this disease, whether they tolerate contact lenses, whether they tolerate RGPs. Um, and then uh, we have to uh, discuss with the patients and ideally the family, these are usually younger adults, uh, that this is not an emetropia achieving procedure at all times. This is a therapeutic procedure to improve visual function, something that most commonly has to be done with spectacle or contact lenses afterwards. And this is very important because even if you do this preoperatively, most patients perceive today in 2020 an ophthalmological procedure as a procedure that it will help them get rid of the glasses. And this is a, a uh, belief that we have to make sure that we, um, uh, we explain well to the patients and the, and the family. And of course, Treating the ocular surface the first few months is also very crucial, but this is not an average PRK. That itself can be challenging sometimes. Combining higher fluence cross-linking with the PRK creates a little bit of an anterior segment uh, management uh, a challenge, I want to say. I don't want to say difficulty. And I think we've reported the largest body of keratoconics patients 
ever in the literature, over 1,000 eyes um, studied very carefully in all their parameters. Um, this is an example uh, of uh, the uh, procedure. Uh, how do we do the procedure? We first uh, ablate the partial refraction topography guided ablation on the epithelium. You can see it's the top left slide. Then we perform the PTK that accounts for epithelial removal. So we use the epithelium as a masking agent. And the reason we re reverse the sequence, it may sound a little bit bizarre, is because we want the higher accuracy that the very sensitive topographic procedure will have initially in delivering uh, the uh, ablation at the exact spot. The PTK to remove epithelium is not that sensitive. It, it's actually not sensitive at all to uh, second rotation. And then myomycin C is 0 0.02% for 30 seconds, and the higher fluence cross-linking, six milliwatts, we went up, down. This is our gold standard. These are, uh, this report from 2009, all the way back. And I think this slide alone is a testament why the concrete guided ablation to be able to rehabilitate the patients. And on the uh, uh, right is the combined procedure. The combined procedure surpassed all the numbers studied, meaning best corrective visual acuity, uh, residual haze, uh, residual cornea thickness. And it is counterintuitive to strengthen the cornea and then go back later if needed and remove some of the best cornea that you have strengthened in the surface in order to attain anormalization. So combining the two for us is a no-brainer. We proved it. We published it many, many years ago. And it itself had signal has signaled using uh, topography modified refractions even in virgin eyes. But uh, let's go uh, look at some clinical examples again, just like I showed in the beginning here, the difference as we're seeing on the right image is over 10 diopters. And you cannot accomplish this with cross-linking alone. You cannot accomplish this with laser alone. It's the combination of the two that creates the synergy. Of course, the synergy is not 100% predictable. We may get a six diopter, seven diopter flattening from the steepest part of the cone. We may get a 15 diopter flattening. So thus, we have to be very careful with this. These are the 10 year data we presented uh, two years ago. This has been published since. And as you can see here, the key thing, looking at this very busy table is that our one year results are pretty much the 10 year results as well. So one can say with certainty that when combining the two procedures, uh, at one year, you can basically see what the end result will be. But of course, long-term follow-up is very important. You can see also here very uh, graphically how the uh, flattening uh, is dramatically improved at one year, in, in essence, the first three months, and then remains stable. But with a trend for a little bit more flattening, this is an example uh, case uh, top before, uh, next to it after, and how the years that followed it demonstrated a little bit more flattening as the cornea remodeled and the end result of 13 doctors flattening. This is a result here, and we reported this in our 10-year data. This is under 1% of the cases, but some become over flattened. The flattening here is close to uh, 16 doctors. And of course, this is not uh, expected. It's an unexpected, not corrected with uh, glasses, contact lenses, or RGPs. We can do a hyperopic laser and reverse the extreme flattening and still have a very factual cornea and avoid the cornea transplantation. Now, as far as pediatric CXL, because some of these patients are recognized at 12, 11, we treated an 11 year old uh, uh, within list last year, just before, before the uh, uh, COVID uh, quarantine. We reported this uh, at the ACRS and the Academy in 17. The results are very similar. You can see these graphs are almost similar with the 10 year results in adult patients. Uh, and we found that um, uh, in uh, this uh, pediatric group, the results are also very promising. Of course, it's more challenging performing a, a um, topography guided PRK in a 13 or 12 year old patient, and that has its own uh, difficulties. But uh, if it was my child, I would certainly uh, choose the combination technique, taking that it, it proper consent was given and information uh, to the parents uh, for this. Now, uh, again, uh, some of the results, this is the evolution of uh, now not using standard pattern CXL, but a customized pattern CXL. This is the mosaic device by Avidro. And you can see on the bottom right that we're designing a multi-scheme um, 
uh, in, as far as power and shape uh, cross-linking the center, oblique trapezoid will, will receive 17, uh, I'm, actually, I'm sorry, 15 joules of energy. The outer one, 10 joules, and the red circle will re receive the standard five joules of energy with a Dresden protocol. And the reason for this is to attain an extra refractive effect. And in this case, we used uh, a very uh, slight uh, uh, laser ablation, but this customized cross-linking was able to add to the refractive effect, and this is an uh, evolution of our Athens protocol. And last, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, using a fascinating technology in virgin myopic eyes, but how we adapted this technology in performing Athens protocol cases. Ray tracing has been an idea uh, many years out how to customize an ablation using simultaneously wavefront data, topo tomographic data, and actual length measurement data. And in ray tracing, that we, uh, we were the first center uh, working with this back in uh, fall of 2019, basically constructs a model eye from the interferometry parameters measured for each patient's each eye, not the gold uh, standard eye that's used for all laser procedures. And then it uses ray tracing from wavefront from the retina uh, forward and uh, from the cyclic device towards the eye, both meet at the anterior surface of the lens. 2000 rays studied artificial intelligence comes in and gives us the key refraction and the tilt between the lens and the cornea, where, well, this is well where the secret holds for keratoconus because the difference when you ray trace these eyes with the artificial intelligence of the end of eye software by Alcon, in essence, the keratoconic cornea is measured by the device as a cornea that's tilted. So it, the, most of the irregularity in keratoconus here is not treated as with topography and normalizing the cornea, but it's normalizing the theoretical tilt of the cornea to the lens of the eye. And what is the benefit? A much smaller ablative cost to the patient. You can see on the top of these figures, a topo-guided approach for the same patient on the bottom, uh, a ray tracing, with Innovise artificial intelligence approach. And you can see that there's very little laser performed at the peak of the cone. Most of it is the, the hyperopic arc superiorly. And we are reporting our first cases with this. This is an example case before and after. And how with removing now very little tissue, 20, 30 microns, we can get a similar result. Uh, this is the uh, algorithm be, be behind ray tracing, I think. Uh, it's too complicated to discuss in this short uh, presentation. Uh, we do have complication with uh, the Athens protocol, delayed epithelial healing, but this holds true with cross-thinking alone. There may be a tear scarring, again, a complication that is shared with cross-thinking alone. We can get over-flattening of the cornea, more rare with cross-thinking alone. Um, the key thing is to have good delivery of the ablation because you can have a mismatch of the measure to deliver it, and this is where your laser uh, takes place. We even studied the psychometric quality of life improvement. It's dramatic. This has been published as well. And I want to close with uh, underlining that I'm convinced, I think it's a lost opportunity for any young patient who has progressive keratoconus not to perform a partial refraction, 10, 20 microns ablation, because the, it has a dramatic effect in normalizing the cornea and offering much higher level of visual function. Uh, the alternatives, of course, are doing CXL alone, maybe entertaining a laser ablation later, RGPs, intracornial ring segments, lamellar keratoplasty, and penetrating. Uh, and knowing that crossing alone achieves one to three diopters of cornea flattening. Uh, in patients, especially those that are contact lens intolerant, I think it's a one-way street. We have to entertain the possibility of performing the Athens protocol. And I know that a lot of colleagues are using a customized laser ablation and cross-linking. They try to name it something else, that's okay. Uh, we're not selfish. It is the Athens protocol. We introduced it, but I think the essence here is that we're offering to our patients the best possible solution. Uh, and um, I urge you to at least consider it because this is for the benefit of our patients. And uh, I thank you so much for uh, uh, following me with me this very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, John.